order for you to be completely free from anything in this life, your soul has to be healed. So the healing of your soul is a process where you get back into the flow of divine activity. The healing of your soul is where you rekindle the desire for the decisions that God wants from you. So the healing of the soul is something that people overlook, but it is the most major healing because you, when your body gets healed, you're not going to take this body into eternal life with God per se. You're going to have a glorified body, which means a greater body, a better body, a new body. But if somebody goes to hell, well, hey, that's different. But in the, in the heavenly realm of eternal life, it'll be a new body. So when your body is healed, this is not something that's going to really matter. It's not going to matter in eternity. But when your mind is healed, you break relationship with sin. You break relationship with error and deception. It's so important that you get healed in the mind because when you get healed in the mind, you won't flirt with the wrong person. You won't want the wrong person to favor you. You won't want the wrong person to receive you. Did you know that when your mind is not healed, your desire, the attention of wrong people, your desire, their favor, their acceptance. When your soul is healed, it is an exposure that you have, you have tapped into words of life because there are things that you have to say and pray that goes in line with your soul being healed. You have to focus intently on the soul. The soul will not be healed without intentional words of life that comes from you. So you yourself have to be receiving of soulish healing. The major part of everybody's soul is their mind. Because your mind is where you finalize a decision, is where you finalize what you're going to do. That's why it's dangerous when you become a person, you talk about, I'm the type of person, I don't let people steal my chicken nuggets. Well, say somebody steal your chicken nuggets and the Holy Spirit wants you to let them steal it. Don't, don't stop them. Now you just spoke into existence, I'm going to defy God because I have made up a morale about myself. I, this is my morality, that if somebody steals my chicken nuggets, this is what I do. So you curse yourself. That's what I'm saying. If you don't understand the words of life you should speak, you will constantly curse yourself. Because you'll let come out of your mouth what you're not going to permit, what you're not going to let happen to yourself. And now you don't even know that on the straight and narrow path, God has those very things scheduled for you. I'm the type of person, I don't let people talk to me this way. Now, your boss, you get underneath a boss at your workplace. They demon possess. They talking to you rough. You won't leave the job, not because God wants you to leave. You want to leave the job because you done created a morality about yourself. And now they're going against your morals. So, so you don't want to leave because the Holy Spirit wants you to leave. You want to leave because you have built a memorial of pride about you. What is the blessing that you can get out of Lazarus? Because he had sores all over his body. Lazarus was poor. Lazarus had dogs licking his wounds. My goodness. Lazarus looked bad. He smelt bad bad, his hair was bad, his clothes was old, he was funky, everything was going wrong for Lazarus. So why would the Lord tell a parable about this man? What is the goodness that you could take from Lazarus' characteristics? 
What is something that you could take from Lazarus and look at Lazarus and say, this is what I need to develop in my life. Lazarus did not let anything on the outside disconnect him from what God wanted him to do and where he wanted him to be on the inside. He was disconnected from the natural realm so much that the spirit realm had him at the man's gate and he wouldn't move. When you become stubborn in the word of the Lord for your life, your soul is healed. You got to be stubborn about something in this life. The racist is stubborn about racist, racism. The Congress leader is stubborn about laws and impression of the general public. The police, they are stubborn about the laws of traffic, the laws of driving, the laws of the land, the laws of relationships. Everybody is stubborn about something. And God created everybody with stubbornness inside of their soul because you're supposed to use it for his will. So on the second day, while Esther is hungry, she still doesn't come off the fast because she's stubborn about denying herself. When Mary Magdalene didn't see Jesus' body, didn't see no evidence of the resurrection, she stayed at the tomb because she was stubborn about the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When Joseph was in jail, in prison rather, because of Potiphar's wife saying that she got raped by him, he got embarrassment on his resume, on his record. And the butler and the baker come in from Pharaoh's house. They're sad and Joseph rebukes them. This is the man that, 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 that lost his position, everything. Joseph rebukes them and says, y'all need some joy in your life. How could Joseph rebuke them for joy if he's sad? But he rebuked them for joy because he's joyful. Why is Joseph joyful and it looks like his life is over? They already gave him the prison sentence. They already said you're going to be in here. They already gave him the rules and regulations. He already sees it for himself. But there's another picture that's greater than the picture that the natural realm showed Joseph. And that's the word of the Lord. And he's able to tell them you need to get joy because he has it. But where is his joy coming from? It's coming from his focus and his stubbornness in the word of the Lord. Romans chapter 4 verse 20 and on says that Abraham, he staggered not at the promise of God through doubt and a belief, but was strengthened in his faith, giving glory to God. So when you give glory to God, that means that you start to praise him for everything that you have, your fingers, your eyes, your ears. You don't take things for granted. When you're the type of person that's bringing to God's knowledge, I see this, what you did for me. You know, I'm still thanking the Father today for things that happened two days ago and three days ago because I won't let him forget. The father loves people that are conversationalists. He don't like people that say, you know, God already know everything, so I ain't going to say nothing. Yeah, you stupid. Why did God create your mouth if he didn't want you to talk? God could smell everything, so I don't need to smell nothing. Why did God create your nose? Every part of you, your ears, from your eyes to your nose to your lips, your tongue. And did you know that your voice changes? There are seasons to everybody's voice. You don't have the same voice that you had when you was three years old. You don't have the same voice that you have when you was three months. 
Are you 30 something years old and still got the same voice that you had when you was five? No. So there's a mystery to everybody's voice. The voice changes. Let me shock you. Let me shock you. God's voice changes over time. He don't talk to you the same way. Because there's seasons to the law of voice. There's seasons to the law of voice. So there are some seasons where God's voice is pampering, comforting. There's some seasons where God's voice is soldier. The sergeant, when people are in army training, don't come inside the bunker and say, Hey, baby, you feel like getting up and doing little shit ups and stuff like that? Do you feel like doing a little workout, jumping around, pouncing around a little bit? Would you like to get up off the bunker? Would you like to do a little stretching, a little running at this 5 a.m. mission? Would you like to? If you don't want to, I'll come back around 11 a.m. I'll come back a little later and let you get a little sleep. They come in, hey, 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 everybody, move, 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 move. One, two, three, four. I want you to sit down, sit down, stand up, stand up, stand up. The voice changes. So when God is in the military mode, why is he in the military mode? Because he doesn't want to baby you because you have enough knowledge that's greater than a baby. So why would I do an oxymoron and treat you lesser than your knowledge? How is the knowledge going to come out appropriately if I am babying you and the knowledge is not of a baby? So the voice changes. The voice changes. When God told Samuel, hey Samuel, and he was calling Samuel, and Samuel thought it was Eli talking to him. He thought Eli was talking to him, and, and, and Eli kept telling him, and Eli finally said, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And Eli knew what to tell him to engage a conversation with the Lord. Do you know how to engage a conversation with the Lord? Because he likes to talk to your brain. And this is how your brain is going to get healed. Because you need to receive understanding so that you could be healed in your brain. The brain does not get healed until you understand. If you're still confused about things, you're blocking your healing. You have to understand. Well, you, I understand that God has me in Cincinnati. I understand that God doesn't want me to wear this red garment anymore. I understand that God doesn't want me to eat apples anymore. I understand that God doesn't want me to talk to Philippi no more. Once you understand, now you can stand. Strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. If you don't understand, you're going to live a demonically influenced life in the name of the word of God, not in the word of the Lord. Because the word of God, people are in hell for it. But you can't go to hell for the word of the Lord because the word of the Lord is God telling you exactly what he wants you to be, exactly where he wants you to be, exactly how he wants you to act, exactly what he wants you to say. In the Old Testament, when the prophet would send one of his uh, servants to go anoint somebody, he will always warn his servant, don't greet nobody. If they say hi to you, don't say hi to them. If they greet you, don't greet them back. Why was the prophet saying this? Because words are seeds. And so the prophet is saying, I already seeded in you what you're supposed to operate in. I done gave you the verb of your decisions. I already gave you the activity that, that you're supposed to engage in. It's in the seed of my instruction, my word. So I don't want no other seeds entering into you that will affect what my seed came to do. 
What if a man could get a woman pregnant and then another man can over-pregnant the woman? <laughs> Wouldn't that be crazy? You're like, ah, ah, wait, hey, hey, hey. What if there could be an overriding of pregnancies. But you notice that once a seed grows in a woman, she can't get pregnant anytime during, during the pregnancy. You know why? Because that's, that's how the seed is supposed to operate. When God places a word for your life in you, you're not supposed to go over there to Prophet Dudu and Prophet Dudu say, well, I believe that you're supposed to be a pilot. And you tell Prophet Dudu, no, God told me to be a janitor. I already heard the word of the Lord. Well, I'm hearing something else. I'm hearing you're supposed to be a pilot. And now you have confusion in your life because somebody said this and, and the one that was a right was a janitor. The janitor prophecy. But see, that's the law of Satan. Satan wants to confuse people out of their greatness because you don't have one stream of God's word of the Lord entering into you. So how are you going to fulfill it? Because when you get over here and being a pilot and it gets hard, you say, maybe I'm supposed to be a janitor. And then when you go over here and be a janitor and you start getting persecuted and people start throwing bananas and people start disrespecting you, then you say, maybe I'm supposed to be a pilot. Or well, maybe the world, Lord, and, and now you try to go start pilot school, but then you still working as a janitor. You quit as a janitor. You start pilot school, but then you have some trouble in pilot school. So then you say, let me go get my job back as a janitor. Then then you leave the janitor job when it get hard. Then you say, let me go back and be a pilot. Then the, you get the pilot license. You start driving as a pilot, but then you got issues with the cockpit. You got issues with your co-pilot. Then you say, maybe God want me to be a janitor. That's what he told The voice of the Lord. The only change that it is in is God demanding much of you. So this is how the voice of God changed. The voice of God changes not by the word of the Lord. The voice of God changes by the demand. So, so the Lord never would tell you, you know, you're, you're my prophet. And then the Lord say, you're not my real prophet. I was just playing with you. But the voice of the Lord will change towards the prophet because the prophet, God saying, wait in the morning and acknowledge me before you go with Balak's men. You see, the voice of the Lord towards Balaam was not the change of office, but the change of demand. Oh, I hope you hear me in the Holy Ghost because this really deep what I'm saying and I don't want to confuse you. You just listen to me real slow. The voice of God don't be changing in the assignment. It be changing in the demand. 